This is uh, peace be upon you in Arabic. Uh, let me reintroduce myself. My name is Fadel Solomon. Fadel Solomon. I am uh, 47 years old, even though I look like 67. <laughs> uh, I'm Egyptian. Recently, after the Egyptian Revolution, I started uh, introducing myself <coughs> as an Egyptian, a proud Egyptian. And I participated, uh, like m millions of Egyptians, in the revolution, actually. Uh, I work for Bridges Foundation. It's an international organization specializing in introducing Islam to non-Muslims and in training Muslim public speakers and presenters. I was told that I should come today and talk about a very important topic, and it is jihad. And actually, uh, what people forget always to say when they introduce me is that I'm a filmmaker. I make films. And uh, I made a series of documentaries about Islam called The Fog is Lifting. Part one is called Islam in Brief. It is today in 30 languages, including the Dutch language, of course, and the Hebrew language. And it's all on YouTube. And for the non-Muslim guests today, I brought some DVDs with me, and you will have it. You will also have the second documentary, which is part two of The Fog is Lifting. It is called Jihad on Terrorism. It's a one hour, 40 minutes documentary on Jihad and on terrorism, uh, filmed in seven countries with ten speakers. Half of those speakers are non-Muslims. Uh, one of them is a Nobel Prize uh, laureate for peace. And my presentation today is also about the same topic. The reason why I wanted to do something like that and talk about jihad everywhere is that there's a big gap between the Muslim world and the non-Muslim world when it comes to jihad. In the non-Muslim world, the word jihad scares people. It makes people panic. In the Muslim world, Muslims love this word to the extent that they call their children jihad, boys and girls. I remember after the cartoon crisis, I wanted to go to Denmark to talk about the, this issue, and I had a conference for the journalists in Denmark, and when I went to get the uh, to apply for the visa in the Danish embassy in Egypt, they told me it's not smart to bring an invitation from a, a person called Jihad al farra to, to get the, because the person who invited me is called Jihad, Dr. Jihad. Anyway, I remember that two years ago, I was in Frankfurt, uh, giving, giving my uh, presentations in the Frankfurt Book Messi, which is one of the biggest book fairs in the world. Tens of thousands of people visit this book for every day. So at five, when it closes down, it becomes so crowded. Thousands of people are evacuating the book fair altogether. Five already is rush hour in Germany, as you know. So it's extremely crowded. Uh, every day I used to wait for uh, my train to take me for about half an hour. Trains come, doors open, they are already full. There's no place to step in. So I remember that day, when there was a German journalist waiting next to me in the station, and we couldn't enter two trains when they came, and then he told me, would you like me to tell you a secret? Looks like he, he knew me. He maybe attended a lecture inside or saw me speaking about Islam. He said, would you like me to tell you a secret? I said, sure. Well, he's German, and we're in Germany. Germans knows the, know the secrets of Germany. I thought that he would tell me to walk to a further station and take the train from there. I said, yes, please. He said, if you want to find a place on the next train, when the door opens and you find it full, shout loudly saying, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was trying to maybe uh, provoke me. Quran tells me, that when you are harassed by an ignorant harasser, just say peace. 
which means be calm, control yourself, don't harass people back, don't respond to them. So I didn't respond to him. So he told me, would you like me to tell you another secret? <laughs> I said, go ahead. I said, if you want to be alone in the next train when the doors open, shout loudly saying, jihad. <laughs> I'm Muslim, but I'm also Egyptian. I couldn't control myself. <laughs> so I said, would you like me to tell you a secret, young man? <laughs> and you should see how his face turns so serious. Because as Muslims, our secrets are different. <laughs> I said, all the Muslims in the world love this word so much. He said, what? I thought only 15%. Because this is what you guys are told here in the West. That 15% of Muslims are terrorists. 15% of Muslims are fanatics. 15% of Muslims are prospect suicide bombs. 15% of Muslims, this is 300 million. I said, no, 100% of Muslims love this word so much, we even use it to name our children, boys and girls, here in your country. You can find a three-year-old girl with blue eyes, blonde hair, and you ask her, what's your name, honey? She tells you, my name is Jihad, Amo. <laughs> Come here. Let me tell you what does the word she had means. And this is my area, actually. I'm an electronics engineer. But since about 10, 12 years ago, I focused on this. And now I have a master's degree in Sharia. And I focused a lot on knowing my religion. So before talking about uh, jihad, uh, since I will use some terms, and I want that we all become on the same bandwidth. So I need to define those four terms that I'll be using today. Because some people think that they know what they mean, while they don't really know what they mean. The first one is Islam. Some people think that Islam is one of the three Abrahamic religions, which is not true. Uh, the second term is Allah. Some people think that Allah is the God of Muslims, and that's not true. The third term is Quran. Because some people think that the Quran is a book that was written by Muhammad. That's not true. And the fourth term that I'll be using today is Quran. I'm sorry, Muhammad. So Muhammad, some people think that Muhammad is the founder of Islam. And that's not true. So let's start quickly by defining those four terms and I'll go into the topic. The word Islam, linguistically, the word Islam comes from the root of the word Salama. In the Arabic language, most words come from roots. And the roots normally are three letters. Some roots are four letters. But the word Islam comes from a root of three letters. Se, le, me. In the Arabic language, there are three other words that come from the same root. The first one is submission, the second one is purity, and the third one is peace. Is this lamb in Arabic from the root se, le, me. Salama, salama. Salam, salama. So, those three words come from the same root of the word Islam. Surprisingly, the word Islam idiomatically is a combination of those three words. The word Islam idiomatically means that if any person fully submits himself or herself to the will of God and worships God purely without any association with God, he or she should live in peace and harmony in this life and in the hereafter. So, the word Muslim doesn't mean literally a follower of Prophet Muhammad. The word Muslim literally means in the Arabic language, someone who submits to God and worships God alone without any association with God. Which means that before the birth of Prophet Muhammad, there were Muslims too. So, this is the word Islam. 
Going Islam. Actually, I don't know if you ever thought about this or not. Islam is the only religion in the world which is not called after someone or after a group of people or a tribe or after a geographic region. Like Hinduism, after him, India, a geographic region. Christianity, after Jesus Christ. Buddhism, after Buddha. Judaism, after the tribe of Judas. Islam, after who? The whole world knows how much Muslims love Muhammad so much, but it's offensive for them to be called Muhammadans. How come? I don't know. Did you ever think about this? We will come to this later, but... Uh, so now we talked about Islam. Uh, let's talk about Allah. Muslims believe that there is no God except Allah. And when you, book, when you go to the books of interpretation of the Quran, it tells you this word, Allah, is the Hebrew name for God. The word Allah is not an accurate translation for the word God. The word God can be plural, gods, goddess, godfather, Greek gods, Roman gods, false gods. But the word Allah means the one true God. It cannot be plural, no derivatives. Even Arab Christians in my country call the deity Allah. Even Jewish Arabs, they call the deity Allah. To prove this to you, here. This is the Arabic Christian Bible. Here, this word, at taqween it means Genesis. I know that you don't know Arabic, but who can figure out the word Allah here in this? See, the word Allah exists just in the first paragraph six times. 17 times in the whole page, by the way. Thousands of times all through the Bible. So when Muslims say, La ilaha illallah, there is no God except Allah, it shouldn't be offensive for people who come from Jewish and Christian backgrounds. Actually, this unites us. But Muslims believe that Allah is unique. There is nothing like unto Him. That's the person of the Quran. He's alone the creator of man, so He doesn't look like any man. He's the creator of animals, He doesn't look like an animal. He's the creator of plants, He doesn't look like a plant. Anything that your mind can imagine, He is beyond. He does not father nor is born. He is the creator of the universe. He is the sustainer of all that exists. He provides for us, and at the same time, he provides for every fish in the streams, for the birds in the skies. He is unique. Talking about the Quran, actually Muslims believe in all the scriptures of God. And the Torah that was given to Moses, peace be upon him, the gospel that was given to Jesus, peace be upon him, and the Quran that was given to Muhammad, peace be upon him. Look how the Torah was mentioned in the Quran. The Quran says about the Torah, surely we did send down the Torah to Moses, that in was guidance and light by which the prophets who submitted themselves to Allah's will judged the Jews. So the Torah was mentioned in the Quran as a source of guidance and light. Anything about the gospel? Quran says about the gospel, we send, God says in the Quran about the gospel, we send Jesus, son of Mary, confirming the Torah that had come before him, and we give him the gospel in which was guidance and light and confirmation of the Torah that had come before it. So the gospel was mentioned in the Quran as a source of guidance and light. Of course, when I say that Muslims believe in all the books, I mean that we believe in all the original scriptures that were sent to these messengers in the original text. As soon as man contributes these books, they don't become purely divine anymore. And I'll give you an example. If someone tells you, let me give you a gift, that's a Dutch Quran corrected, tell him, I attended a lecture in a uh, 20 uh, university about Islam, and I learned that there is nothing a so-called Dutch Quran. It's a Dutch translation for the Quran. The Quran is only the Arabic text. We have good translations for the Quran and terrible translations for the Quran. I'm not attacking the Quran like that. I'm attacking the work of a translator. So we believe in these books, in its original language, the original text that was revealed to those messengers. Any human contribution makes it not purely divine anymore. 
while actually some of the human contributions are needed, like translation. We need translations, but we cannot claim that those translations are the words of God. And this, of course, applies in all books, not only the Quran. <clears throat> what is the Quran? I know that probably the non-Muslim guests who are with us today come from a Christian or a Jewish background. So you guys have the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Quran is the last testament. The Quran is the last revelation of God. It is the principal source for every Muslim's faith and practice. And the Quran deals with all subjects that concern human beings, including wisdom, doctrine, worship, and law. And the Quran has two main basic themes. The first one is the relationship between people one and another, and the second one is the relationship between God and his creation. How to communicate with God, how to deal with God, and how God deals with us. And the Quran provides guidelines for a just society, proper human conduct, and equitable economic principles. Muslims believe in all the messengers of God. Actually, Muslims believe that there is only one God. And also Muslims believe that there is only one humankind because there is no difference between us. Men are not better than women. Whites are not better than blacks. Therefore, since there's only one God and only one humankind, this means that there's only one sender and only one recipient. If there's only one sender and only one recipient, why would anyone same think that the same sender will send to the same recipient contradicting messages, different religions? It was always one religion, not the religion of Muhammad. Not the religion of Jesus, not the religion of Moses, but rather the religion of God. Allah in Arabic, Allah in Hebrew, Dieu in French, God with a capital G in English, God in uh, Dutch, right? God. Okay. Huh? Okay, it takes time. So it's only one religion, because there's only one God, and there's only one humankind. And this religion was communicated by God to the humankind once through Muhammad, once before him through Jesus, once before him through Moses, once before him through Abraham, and so on. So one God, one humankind, one religion, many messengers and many books of the same religion. Simple. And this religion of God should be suitable for all people during all ages. All people, whites and blacks, men and women, old and young, tall and short, fat and thin, from the Eskimo to the Amazon. So this religion should be suitable for all people. What is the only thing in the world which is suitable for all people? It's this. Water. People ask you before they serve you coffee. Maybe you don't drink coffee. People ask you before they serve you juice or tea. But the only thing that people don't ask you about is water. Did anyone ever ask you, do you drink water? <laughs> it's even a funny question. Okay, why did you laugh? Why is it a funny question? Why isn't water dealt with like tea and coffee? Simply because water doesn't have any color. Doesn't smell anything. Tastes good for all people because it's neither salty nor sweet. That's why we all drink water. So the religion of God, which is sent to all people through humanity in all ages, from all backgrounds, should be like water, should not be limited, should not be called after someone, should not be called after a tribe, should not be called after a geographic region. Should be called obeying God. That's it. Submitting to God. That's it. That's why. Muslims are offended when they are called Muhammadians because they are not Muhammadians, they are Muslims like Muhammad and like Jesus and Moses and all those. As simple as that. You don't need to be a philosopher to understand Islam. It's a simple religion. Very simple religion. So it was always one message that all messengers carried 
and that was worship God alone and do not associate any partners with him. Muslims believe that all messengers are the best of human beings and they do not commit major sins. And none of them is divine. Which means that Muslims believe that none of them is the Son of God. Muslims believe that Jesus is a messenger like other messengers. Actually, Muslims believe that Jesus is one of the mightiest five messengers. One of the best five people who ever walked the first the, the face of the earth. The first one was Noah, then Abraham, then Moses, then Jesus, then Muhammad. Those five, they suffered most and they had big impact on the world. And Muslims believe that Jesus is coming back before the end of time. I know that this seems beautiful, but maybe Muslims are liars, and when they turn their backs to you, they only believe in Muhammad and the Quran. But here I said it. The Quran is the principal source for every Muslim's faith and practice. The Quran says, say, we believe in Allah. We believe in Allah. And the revelation given to us, which is the Quran, and the revelation given to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and the revelation given to Moses and Jesus, and the revelation given to all the prophets from their Lord. We make no difference between one and another of them. And we submit to Allah with faith, and we are Muslims. So I cannot be Muslim if I exclude Jacob. Then I'm not a Muslim. We don't pick and choose, we take a poll. Therefore, Muhammad is not the founder of Islam, like some people think. Muhammad is just the final messenger of Islam. One of the messengers of Islam. We have a verse in the Quran that says, Muhammad is just a messenger like many others before him who came and died. That's it. Jesus also sinned. Moses sinned. So Muhammad is a colleague of Jesus and Moses and Abraham. A graduate from the same school from which they graduated, the school of God. His traditions are called the Sunnah. It's considered the number two source of Islamic knowledge and legislation. And his people used to call him the trustworthy and the truthful. His people, who were pagans, they used to love him so much. Until he became a prophet. Until he said, there is no God except the one true God, Allah in Arabic, Allah in Hebrew. And then things changed. Those who possessed power and wealth opposed him. And they tried hard to stop him. They tried to kill him and his followers, and they killed some of his followers. It's worth mentioning that uh, the very first martyr in Islam was not a man at all, but a woman called Lady Sumayya. She was jabbed by a spear in her private parts by the very first Islamic fool, Abu Jah. And they tortured him and his followers, and they negotiated with him. They said, what do you need? Money? We can make you the most rich, but please stop preaching what you're preaching. Women? We can marry from the most beautiful women, but please stop preaching what you are preaching. Power? We can make you the king of Arabia. But stop preaching what you're preaching. And he said, if you put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand to quit, I won't quit until this message is conveyed or I die conveying it. He was the most beautiful example because he was not just a prophet. He was also a merchant, a father, a husband, a teacher, a politician, a negotiator, and a warrior. And today we will talk about the combat orders of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon us. But I need to tell you that Prophet Muhammad was also a reformer. He was the only man that I know in history who was able to convince Muslims and Jews and pagans to sit together and sign one pact saying, this city is our city and we are one people and if our city is ever under attack from outside we will fight side by side defending our city while loyalty at that time was only for the tribe but he was the only man in history who was able to make all those people from different backgrounds 
transcend their tribal differences and start thinking like a single society. Ban Ki-moon can do that today. He gave hope to billions of people through his teachings. Actually, this teaching is one of the teachings that always has shaken me. He said, if you are planting a tree and the end of the world came, just go ahead and plant it quickly. And I know, I know it sounds funny. What does it mean to plant trees at the end of the world? No one will eat from it. No coming generation to eat from it. Sounds funny. But actually it explains the system in Islam. In Islam, people will not be held accountable for their results before God, but rather for the effort. Here in this life, you are held accountable for your effort. Your boss tells you, I'm sorry, for your results. Your boss tells you, come here, show me your numbers, show me your sales, show me the report. And it's fair because the, the boss cannot know the effort. God doesn't care about your results. He cares about your effort. Keep doing effort until the last breath. Uh, many non-Muslim intellectuals spoke highly about Prophet Muhammad because they were fair when they read his biography. They didn't read it selectively. Like this man, Lamartine. He's a famous French historian who authored the book L'Histoire de la Turquie. In his book he said, if greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and outstanding results are the three criteria of a human genius, who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad? If greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and outstanding results are the criteria of a human genius, that's exactly what happened to him. Mahatma Gandhi, this man of peace, he said about the Prophet, I became more than convinced that it was not the sword that won a place for Islam in those days in the scheme of life, but it was the rigid simplicity, the utter self-effacement of the Prophet, the scrupulous regard for his pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his intrepidity, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in God and in his own mission. Wolfgang Goethe. You say Goethe or Goethe? Goethe. Goethe. I've been to his house in Frankfurt. It's a museum. And there I saw his tools of learning Arabic. He always wanted to write poetry in Arabic. He said, he is a prophet and not a poet, and therefore his Qur'an is to be seen as a divine law, not as a book of a human being made for education or entertainment. Now let's talk about jihad. But before talking about jihad, we have to talk about another J word, and that's justice. Is justice important in Islam? Yes. How important? Extremely important. In Islam, justice is the reason why God sent messengers and books with them. The reason why God sent Muhammad and the Quran with him, Jesus and the Gospel with him, Moses and the Torah with him, Abraham and the scrolls with him, David and the Psalms with him is to establish justice according to Islamic teachings in the Quran uh, in Surah Al Hadid, Surah chapter number 57, verse number 25. God said, We sent aforetime our messengers with clear signs and sent down with them the book and the balance of knowing right from wrong that people may stand forth in justice. Justice is extremely important in Islam. God said in the Quran to the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, Surely we have sent down to you the book, which is the Quran, in truth, that you might judge between people by that which Allah has shown you. So be not a pleader for the treacherous and argue not on behalf of those who betray themselves. Actually, this verse descended on the Prophet 
for a reason. There was a Muslim who stole something from another Muslim, and he was afraid to be caught with it, so he went to a Jewish neighbor, he knocked his door, the man opened, he said, can I keep this with you as a trust? So the Jew took it, he said, okay, we're well. He took it. Looks like it was dripping some flour or something. It was found in the Jew's house. He was taken to the Prophet. And he said, I didn't do anything. I didn't steal anything. It is this Muslim guy who brought it to my house. So the Prophet said, bring me this boy. The family of the man came and they said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, he confessed. It's true. He is the one who stole it. But he regretted and he swore never to steal again. Please spare him and let the punishment fall on the Jew. He's a Jew. Of course, the Prophet would never think about that as an option. But still, Allah told him in the Quran that's not even an alternative. I have sent you the Quran to judge between people, not between Muslims. By that which Allah has shown you, which means by justice. So be not a pleader for the treacherous, this treacherous Muslim. And are you not on behalf of those who betray themselves? Period. So, in Islam, justice is the ultimate goal. God said in the Quran, O oh, you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah, even though it be against yourselves or your parents or your relatives. This verse, since two months, is now put in the lobby of the law school of Harvard University. You know why? People don't know why, especially in law schools in America, they are putting this. Because in law schools in America, they want to change the American Constitution. But it's not allowed. But the American Constitution was put by the founding fathers of America. The Fifth Amendment of the American Constitution allows the American citizen not to witness, not to testify if his testimony will hurt him or his parents from the first degree. Of course, this is an obstruction of justice. But because it was put by the founding fathers, they went around it and they made something called the Sabina system. So if you are Sabina, you receive a Sabina, which means you are invited to testify before a grand jury, you cannot abstain. In the Quran, 1400 years ago, it was said, you cannot abstain. You have to testify and say the truth. Because if you abstain from testifying, or if you lie in your testimony, probably an innocent person will be hurt. Even if it's against yourself, or your parents, or your relatives. Absolute justice. I always like to mention the story which happened in my country, in Egypt, 1400 years ago. Egypt is one of the first countries that became Muslim. And the son of the ruler of Egypt, Amr ibn al-As, who was a great companion of Prophet Muhammad, and that was at the time of the second caliph, Omar, after the death of Prophet Muhammad by about 10 years. What happened is, the son of Amr ibn al-As, the ruler of Egypt, was racing against some Egyptians. And looks like an Egyptian Christian won. So they fought with each other, and he beat him up. And he told them, how come you win the son of the two noble people? He started to be proud. His Arab, his father, and his mother are from a high lineage, an aristocratic family. So the cop took his mule, and he traveled all the way to Medina. It took him like two months to file a claim against this boy. Just this act shows me that even the Muslims in the Muslim state at that time trusted the judiciary system. There he filed a claim. Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, brought Amr ibn al-As himself and his son. And the boy confessed. He said, yes, I lost my temper and I beat him up. I'm sorry. He said, sorry? It's time for Sharia. Beat him up on his bullhead. And Omar gave his wooden stick to the Egyptian cop. He said, beat him up like he did. He said, he told him, beat up the son of the two noble people. And then he looked at Amr ibn al-As. 
And he told him, the ruler of Egypt, a companion of Prophet Muhammad like Umar, he said, tell me, Amr, when did we start enslaving people? Which means that this generation of Muslims, the students of the Prophet, looked at themselves as liberators, not as killers, not as people who go and enslave people. 